my great <laughs> honor and pleasure to introduce Wania Tebow. You may have seen this phenomenal woman on the History Channel show alone in the past few months. This is one of the most courageous people on the planet. She <laughs> volunteered to be dropped in the Arctic on the eve of winter by herself to see how long she could survive with 10 items such as a bow and arrow and she can tell you all the details but nothing like a, sh like a tent or um, uh, a generator. None of those things got to go with her or a food truck so she really had to make everything come together on her own and survive a tr like a tremendous experience that, that she really navigated with such grace. Uh, and she's also the founder of Buckskin Revolution and I'll let her tell you all about it, but she is a national role model for so many things, ancestral skills, primitive skills, and how to know what's happening in the woods around you by listening to the birds. So we are so honored and lucky to have you here to tell us about your experience and tell us what the birds told you out there in the Arctic. As, as Molly said, uh, I have been studying and teaching ancestral skills for the last 23 or so years, and what I mean by that are some of the skills that our ancestors, not just our recent ancestors, but going back, you know, thousands to hundreds of thousands of years, used to live in the world in a way that was sustainable and in deep connection with the landscape around them, dependent on that landscape for for their lives. Um, so this has been a huge focus of mine for all of my adult life, and it really stemmed from a deep connection with the land around me and this sense of curiosity about what was going on in the natural world that Will was talking about with bird language. So I grew up um, in Nevada County in the Grass Valley area with two parents who were very outdoorsy, got dragged to Sierra Club hikes every weekend of my childhood and was crewing my dad in 100 mile races in the Sierras. So, you know, definitely really deeply immersed in in the wild but you know I also grew up in a typical suburban home and you know my food came from the refrigerator not from the land around me but I was always fascinated with the more ancient life ways and absolutely obsessed with reading all of the Laura Ingalls Wilder books and homestead era and kind of bygone times and you know I also didn't really realize that that was possible anymore that that was accessible to me so I spent my childhood you know pretending that I was Karana from Island of the Blue Dolphins and harvesting my food and tucking it away but not really realizing that that was something that I could actually be doing um, so but that love of the natural world led to my studying biology and botany in college and then doing a degree in environmental science um, for my masters and really having both the, the academic learning and this really deeply rooted visceral learning of practicing these skills and I was I was 19 years old when I first was introduced to the ancestral skills community through a skills gathering which happened all around the country still um, and was able to to see that this was actually something that I could be doing in my daily life right now you know it wasn't just in history books and and it really felt like a way to merge my my obsession with learning about the natural world with things that actually affect my life and over time I've come to see that there's a reason why I was so drawn to both those things right that's what we evolved to do to be in this deep intimate relationship with the natural world around us not just because it's cool and it's fascinating but because it's what our lives depend upon and that's something that I feel like we've gotten so far from in our world today. And we're beginning to really see the way that sense of disconnect is affecting our world, our lives, you know, all of humanity. And because humanity is this very powerful force, every living creature on the planet. And again, as Will kind of brought in, we're seeing that today, you know, that's very present with us in our lives right now. And also we're seeing it in the populations of birds and you know, M Molly invited me here to talk about my, my tales of Arctic survival to an event that's about birds and bird language and climate change, and those seem like they might be really different things. So I want to talk about why they're all the same thing, why they're deeply related, and hoping that by the end of my talk that will be super, super clear without me having to pinpoint exactly why. Um, so. As, as I said, I've been, I've been teaching these skills for a long time, and in the last, I don't know, maybe five to ten years, there's been this huge influx of 
huge interest in these skills and a lot of survival television shows. And because I've been teaching this stuff for a long time and, you know, have, have a reputation in the field, I've been contacted by a lot of those shows. And so many of them are frankly totally gross to me, right? They're all about, like the name of one of them is Man vs. Wild. You know, they're this very adversarial approach, which is the exact opposite of why I practice these things and what I believe in. So to me, this whole like afraid and fear the world and fear nature and conquer nature and it's our duty to, to be out there and tame the wilderness, it's the polar opposite of the direction that I want to go. And I think it's responsible for the things we're seeing now where people treat the natural world as a grocery store, right? And I just take this because I want it and someone's gonna fill that shelf again afterwards like we do with fossil fuels and, and other natural resources. And at the same time as we're seeing more and more change in the world around us, we're seeing increasing levels of depression and antidepressants and medication and, and social media filling every gap in everyone's time because if they actually took a minute to be still and feel what was happening in themselves and in the planet, then we might have you know, some serious issues. So I believe that getting back to our roots and the kind of relationship that we evolved to have with the natural world is the key to being whole, healthy, happy people and a whole, happy, healthy culture that supports one another and the key to living in the world in a sustainable way that isn't making it worse day by day by our own actions. So that's a little bit of who I am and what I believe. And that's what I was trying to do for years through my teaching of ancestral skills was to help people find the sense of connection through their hands, right? Through their body, through making the things that they needed for their daily life. I found that I wasn't always doing that to the degree I wanted to. People, you know, people were getting a lot out of my classes and really enjoying it and loving making things out of buckskin or baskets or what have you, but I wasn't always reaching those deeper places. And through my teaching at these different gatherings, I came into contact with the folks from Weaving Earth, Will and, and the folks that he works with, and saw that we were really trying to reach the same places with our teaching, but we were coming from different places. Right? They were coming from the connection, and I was coming from the skills, but we were both trying to get to that place of connecting to who we are and who the people around us and, and what the world is and our connection to that and our place in it. Years later, I found myself in a place of having left my skills school and left the off-grid community I was living in and finding myself kind of searching for something new and ended up becoming a student in the Weaving Earth program and really diving in to bird language and nature connection in a really different way than I had even with a master's in environmental science and having taught in the skills world for decades. And it really changed something inside me to be coming from a place of connection rather than getting to that place eventually through the physical. And I feel like it just really upped my my understanding of the world around me, my connection to myself, and my belief in myself in a really different way. And it was from that place that I received an invitation to do this show that I had heard a little bit about, um, which was called Alone. And I think I probably would have ignored that request like I ignored a lot of other requests, except for the way that invitation came to me. And that was that I was on a wilderness trip with the group of second years, Lara and Lila um, were both on that trip. And we had such an amazing, amazing time. And I've done a lot of wilderness trips with very minimal gear or all Stone Age gear, not bringing any food or bringing only wild food. And this was a trip like that. But again, what was different about it was the intention going in. We, you know, we stood in a circle and we spoke our group intention and our individual intentions for the trip before we hiked out there. And we hiked out in silence and we let the landscape lead us to the place that we were to be for that trip. And my intention for the trip was to lean into a sense of comfort, to do something that before might have seemed like, like this edgy experience and try to find my sense of comfort rather than pushing myself to the edge. On that trip, we had an epic rainstorm and the next day I went out onto the landscape by myself and there was water all over the landscape and it was a hike at dusk and I hadn't brought anything with me. I didn't have a water bottle and I was moving on the landscape like a wild creature and the pinnacle of that to me was 
getting down on all fours to slurp water out of a puddle. And it was harder than you would have thought, you know, like not to scoop with your hands or to drink it out of something, but just like to stick your face in the water and suck it up. And there was something about it that I was like, now I live here. Now I'm of this place, like the wild creatures are of this place, like no interface between me and this wild water. And while I was out on that hike, I felt a draw to go to this certain overlook and as I was sitting there I saw this shape down on the on the landscape below me and there was something strange about it and I couldn't quite tell what it was but I was drawn to it and over over the course of a couple minutes it kind of popped out at me these little black and white dots and then the whole form emerged and it was a bobcat and it was sleeping on a rock and I watched it for a long time until eventually a canyon ran alarmed and caused the bobcat to look around and we made eye contact. And this bobcat and I just stared at each other for such a long time. And eventually, as we stared at each other, its eyelids started to get heavier and it nodded to sleep. And there was something about that moment that was so poignant to me because I felt trusted by this completely wild creature. You know, to feel safe enough to fall asleep with me watching it really reinforce this idea that like yeah i'm of this place now i'm not i'm not foreign to it now and that moment was really poignant for me because i had stopped doing these wilderness trips for some time you know i'd been invested in teaching and my school and building a home and all of these things and then kind of leaving that home and feeling lost in the world and there was this this centering moment of like this was what my life was all about at one time these kinds of moments and this kind of extreme you know, dive into living wild. And so I was leaving that trip with this intention, like I am doing this again. I am making this a bigger part of my life. I'm inviting in more of these trips, but like deeper and longer and with less people and like more connection. And I left that trip and I checked my email and I had an invitation to do this show alone. The premise of the show is that they take you, you choose 10 things so amongst us, like your cook pot and your sleeping bag and a means of fire starting, just 10 things, and they drop you in a wilderness location and see how long you can last out there. And it was exactly what I'd been asking for, but I never in a million years pictured it televised. <laughs> and yet, it was what I had been asking for, so I didn't feel like I could say no. You know, I felt like I had to, I had to see it through, and so that began this whole wacky, <laughs> past year of my life which was absolutely amazing and so life-changing and so so many levels you know one of my major motivations for it was that you know the reason I have devoted my life to teaching ancestral skills again is to inspire people and to show them what they're capable of and to help foster this sense of connection and mutual and reciprocity with the world, right? Relying on the world, but also feeding that world through our relationship with it. And I realized that I've been, you know, I've been preaching to the choir by mostly doing this work amongst groups of people who are already at these skills gatherings because they want that. And there are so many of these shows out there, and I really believe that the reason why these shows are so popular is because people are desperate for that sense of connection, and they don't know how to get it. And so they're trying to get it vicariously through television because that's the medium we have available to us these days, and they're not getting that. They're getting man versus wild. They're getting adversary. They're getting dominance, you know? And I realized that my choosing to do this show was going to access millions of people who who might not get that in any other way and give all of these people access to it and if what i really cared about was was teaching this stuff then having that kind of a platform to do it was the most important thing i could possibly do um that said you know i wasn't in charge of the editing <laughs> so i could only do my best and shows like this you know drama is what sells so they are gonna they are gonna do up the drama but um, that was really my, my goal in doing it, was trying to bring, bring forward a different approach to survival than what you typically see if, if you ever watch any of these shows, which frankly I don't. So, you know, it was a wacky time preparing for the show and trying to decide what those 10 items was gonna be. And one of the things that felt really important to me was making as much of my own gear as possible. Because again, that's, that's what I do. So one of the major focuses of my business is teaching people to tan hides 
naturally, um, brain tanning, deer hides particularly, and making clothing out of them. Because to me, you know, our food and our clothing, those are two things that unless you're fasting or living in a delightful tropical climate, you're probably doing both of those things every day. You're probably wearing clothes and eating food every day. So, so I like to focus on those skills that really are a part of people's lives on a daily basis. And so for me, I had very little time to prep for this, this survival adventure, and I didn't know where I was going until the very end, but I really wanted to do it in my own homemade gear because that's who I am and what I do and what I really wanted to represent. But the time frame was insane for doing all of that stuff. Anyone who saw me that summer, as people are laughing because it was unreal. It was so crazy. Like literally sleeping three and four hours a night sometimes so that I could get as much of my gear done. And, and it was shoddy gear <laughs> because I had way too little time to do it. So I was like add to the stress of knowing that I was going to be in the Arctic surviving by myself without food for who knows how long, but that I wasn't taking fancy technical gear and everybody else out there was doing it and that I was doing the things that I do for a living, but doing them crappily because I didn't have time to do them well. And not only that, but my life was going to depend on my crappy gear and millions of people were going to be seeing it and seeing me in crappy gear when what I actually do is make some pretty good stuff. Um, so. It was, it was pretty wild, but you know, that was my commitment and I decided I wanted to go as myself with my own gear or not at all. So I slept four hours a night. Oh, and then also in the middle of my prep time, my mother had a horrible accident and broke her leg and was in a wheelchair and I had to go and live with her for a month of my two months prep time, helping my mom out because she couldn't do anything for herself. So it was crazy. Um, but also I feel like there was some way that the intensity of that summer and the fact that I lived through that meant that I could survive anything. Arctic, be fine. So we got a certain amount of clothing and then 10 items. So I took a sleeping bag, a cooking pot, a ferro rod, for, which is a, a thing for starting fires. I've actually got it behind me. Um, I can show that later. Um, a ferro rod, uh, my bow and arrows, fishing line and hooks. I got 300 feet of fishing line and 25 hooks, um, uh, a knife, a leatherman, a saw, paracord, and two pounds of pemmican. And I wasn't counting, but I believe I mentioned everything. Anyone count and see if that was 10? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so that's what I had with me. And a huge case with 60 pounds of camera gear and a tarp. We were given one tarp because we had all this fancy camera gear so they wanted to make sure that our shelter was going to be waterproof <laughs> um, and a first aid kit and that's it and people are like well what about your journal that you kept no journal no nothing nothing extraneous nothing that could have any survival advantage nor anything to help keep you sane in complete isolation because that's a big part of the premise of the show and the survival aspect isn't just that you're out there without shelter or food in the Arctic, you're there by yourself. They ask, you know, well, what's the longest you've ever spent by yourself? And I didn't even know, you know, I've never kept track like, oh, didn't see anyone today. <laughs> but probably, you know, like six days, maybe, you know, probably like four or five days is my longest solo backpacking trip. So I had no idea how that would be. And I actually worked with a friend of mine who a bunch of folks here know whose name is Twig, who works with, um, he works with this healing modality, trauma healing modality called somatic experiencing. And it's all about understanding the nervous system from, from a physiological perspective and the ways that we process trauma in our body. And I did a lot of work with him on how to regulate my nervous system in isolation because most of what makes people feel okay is social engagement. Very literally, the act of nodding your head and raising your eyebrows and speaking that is hardwired to your nervous system and to your heart. So when you're, in, when you're having panic, speaking to another person literally lowers your heart rate. So the idea of not having that out there was, was a big thing. And, and you know, he's a good friend of mine. And so he was saying, this is gonna be a bigger deal than you realize. And I'm gonna circle back to that because that's really important in my story and how birds and bird language and the natural world tied into my story. It was below freezing before we even left. Um, it was sleet and snow and intense weather before we before we ever left. So they had us for about nine days, kind of a, a base camp before we got set 
um, in our in our individual locations and the weather was already really intense and I actually ended up changing a couple of my items last minute because of the intensity of the weather before we left I had intended to bring snare wire and use that and fishing line as my cordage but these winds were so intense before we left they were threatening to blow over these wall tents that they had us in and I thought oh my gosh trying to build a shelter without cordage or just snare wire as cordage given these conditions you know wire it goes back and forth a few times and then it snaps that's the nature of wire so like two days before leaving I pulled out my snare wire and I put paracord in instead so I thought well you know I know I'm gonna need shelter. I don't know whether or not I'm gonna need to snare and I don't know how good I would be at snaring, so what, whatever. <laughs> well, I had the next two and a half months to regret that particular decision. Um, so, so the weather got intense right away and my plan all along had been to really focus on my shelter early on because it's the Arctic, right? You never know when winter is going to hit and I didn't think it would be hitting early September, but I didn't know anything about the Arctic. And my research had said anywhere between, you know, the end of September and late November for a freeze up and the real setting in of winter. Um, so I think it was a really good choice for me to focus on my shelter early on rather than on food. So my first week was really focusing on shelter. Now this location is a world renowned fishing place. People come from all over the world there's huge lake trout pulled out of there, you know, walleye and arctic char and whitefish and pike and all kinds of record-setting fish from this place. So fishing seemed like it was going to be the key to being out there. And it was probably day four or five when I first went fishing because I'd been focusing on my shelter. And every time I'd be like, okay, my shelter's good enough for now. I can start to focus on food. Then we'd get a storm and I'd be like, okay, let's make these walls another foot thicker and, you know, get get more bows and make this place more weather tight. Um, so the shelter was an ongoing thing, but you know, it's not very long living out in really cold conditions by yourself before you start thinking that food is also really important. So, you know, in survival situations, it's just this constant balance of what is gonna do best for me in terms of calories and really good shelter is hugely important in terms of calories, right? Because being really cold means that you're burning a ton of calories. So it's this constant dance of what, what's gonna give me the best return. So it was day five before I started really putting energy towards fishing and it wasn't going very well because I couldn't get to any, any deep water from where I was. So I was going different conditions. I was trying different amounts of weight so that my, my line would fly further and I could get it further into the lake. But it was all of these very shallow, jagged rocks. So the more weight I put on my line, the more I lost my tackle because it sank. So then I was making floats out of willow and trying to get the right ratio between weight and floats and losing so much tackle. And no matter what I did, you know, I could get my line 30, 40 feet offshore, but that was like a foot and a half of water. And that is not where the big fish hang out. So every day I was re-strategizing and I was fishing from different places. I was on a little peninsula. So I fished from every possible place off of that peninsula, every different time of day, every different weather condition, and never a sign, never a, you know, a little dimple on the water, no sign of fish anywhere. And it was the best chance that I had so I kept after it, but it, it was not looking good. And I should say that there were a lot of squirrels in my area and I had a bow and you know, most of my target shooting and I was shooting my bow every single day up until the, the day I launched, but I was mostly doing target shooting straight out ahead of me. And it's really different shooting straight up. And when you're shooting straight up, it's really hard to know where your arrows go. Right? Because not only is it harder to see up versus out, you know, you have a pretty good idea, but up, it's really hard to tell the exact angle. And then also it's always going to be hitting branches if you're shooting at squirrels and trees, which are going to deflect it. So by day 12, I had lost four of my nine arrows. And I told myself, I, this, I can't do this. Like I can't keep shooting into trees. I have to make a rule that I don't shoot at anything unless it's backed by something I can see, you know? So, the thing that was really beautiful about those first couple weeks was I was very hungry, increasingly hungry, and I started to feel the effects of hunger a bit. You know, I would notice my legs feeling a little weak and wobbly while I was climbing up from the water, getting water, and, um, you know, definitely uncomfortably hungry. 
and feeling a little weak at times and really starting to drop into what it is to be on a landscape really hungry. And that was a really beautiful experience because I feel like so few people in our culture ever experience true hunger. You know, you might do a fast, but usually you're gonna, you're gonna be shifting your activity based on that. But here I was, you know, going full force all the time because my life depended on, it. I needed that shelter. I needed, you know, to, to haul water every day. I needed to have an idea of the landscape and what was moving on the landscape. All of these things mattered hugely, but I also wasn't eating. So I, I got to this place where, and I'm so glad that we launched when we did actually, because it was the most stunning place I've ever been in my life. You know, it was full fall when we launched. So it was absolutely gorgeous. We had willow and we had a ton of birch and the golden birch leaves were just incredible. And then there's this dwarf birch tree that they have up there, which has these deep, rich, golden, like browny gold leaves. And then there were reds in the landscape too. So it was just epically beautiful. These amazing colors against this really sear gray rock against this huge, huge lake. So it was so beautiful. And I was so thrilled to be there even though, you know, it was challenging. But I just reached this place where I recognized that food wasn't coming in and I absolutely wanted to be there. Leaving was the furthest thing from my mind. And that I needed to, I needed to be able to be fed by something different. Learning to recalibrate my system to be fed by beauty, to be fed by the world around me. And that was so true to me. And one of the things that was really key for me in maintaining that was was daily rituals and weekly rituals about connection and about appreciation and about giving back. And so one of the things I did was every morning I sang the sun up. I sat in my shelter and those first few rays of sun, I would sing, I would sing a rising sun song. And every evening when it was starting to get towards dusk, I would go down to the water. I didn't always go to the water, but every evening I sang the sun down with, with a lovely sunset song caught by a dear friend of some of ours, Ida Rado. And those practices were so beautiful for me. And really taking that time, even though I was in this, you know, intense survival type situation, I, I use quotes because I thought it was a survival situation for those first couple weeks of going hungry, but then I was out there for another like eight weeks. And so now I'm like, those first few weeks, those were cake, those were nothing. I had no idea, but they felt like a big deal at the time. and. And that sense of being fed by something greater and that sense of ritual and daily gratitude practices, those were everything. Those really set the tone for me and my time out there. And it was, it was huge. I'm a person who's very, very keyed into seasonal cycles and, you know, honoring, honoring the, the turning of the year. And so autumnal equinox is a big thing for me. And I woke up that morning and I spoke to the camera. Every morning we were required to do a daily log where we talked about what our plans for the day were and how the night was and anything that was up for us. And my daily log, I said, this is a special day. This is the autumnal equinox. This is the balance of the year, right? Exactly equal day and night. So this is the tipping point and everything changes from here. We go from here, we're going into winter. We're going into the dark. It's a different energy. And I said, this is the tipping point and this is the day my luck is gonna change. Everything's gonna change for me on this day, I know it. And then I went out to my fish spot or the fish spot chosen for that day and I fished for an hour and it was calm and beautiful when I started and then sure enough, after I'd been fishing for a few minutes, the wind picked up and just blew my tackle right back at me and fishing wasn't gonna happen. So. I packed up my things and I was heading back to my to my home. I, I really tried to call it my house or my cabin rather than my shelter out there because shelter gives this idea of camping and impermanence. And I really wanted, you know, to own that I lived there. This was my home, not my temporary shelter. So, um, so I was on my way back to my house and I saw a squirrel chattering at me from a tree and it was in a low branch and behind that branch there were rocks. And I was like, okay. I can shoot at this squirrel. So I, you know, I set up the camera because that's what you do. You set the camera up before you do anything. And I took careful aim and I shot that squirrel right off the branch and pinned it to the ground by its chest. And that was huge. <laughs> that was monumental for me after not having had any protein and nothing but berries and little pinches. I did bring pemmican as one of my items. So I'd had little pinches of pemmican, but besides those I had had nothing and here was a squirrel, teeny squirrel, 
but it was a squirrel and it was amazing and I was so grateful and I was so moved and it was the day I said things would change which was amazing so I'm hiking back to my house with my squirrel so excited to process it and eat it and on my way back I hear this noise that I'd never heard before out there a, a little squawking noise and I look up in a spruce tree and there's a grouse and it is the first time I've seen a grouse on this peninsula my whole time out any sign of grouse and there it is in the tree and I set down my things and I set up the camera and and I take aim and I miss it and then I do that again and I miss it again but grouse you know they're not they're not used to people out there so it's just like oh what was <laughs> and my third shot I watched the arrow go right through that grouse and then the grouse took off and I went around and I picked up my arrow and it was red from tip to feather. It was completely covered in blood and little feathers. It was like, it was like it was staged. I actually had someone comment on the show, that was totally fake because it was like so perfect. This like blood stained arrow with little feathers stuck all over it. So I knew that I had hit it. I knew that it was a mortal shot and it had taken off. And this grouse is black and white in a black and white granite <laughs> landscape. And it could have gone anywhere. You know, I saw the, the direction it flew, but it could have gone anywhere. So I, so I set down the camera, I was like, screw filming this. I'm just, I'm finding this grouse. And I looked and I looked and I looked for it and I didn't find it. And then I, you know, it's like, just sat for a while and just spoke my prayers and, you know, how important it was for me to find this animal. Like it wasn't just that I needed that food, it was that I had killed this animal, you know? I needed to find it. And so I, I picked up the camera again and I did another circle and there was this copse of trees that I thought it might be in. And as I'm circling around, I see this patch of sunlight and in that sunlight is that grouse. And it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen <laughs> on so many levels. I mean, it was like lit by this patch of sun which made it glow you know i don't know that i would have seen it otherwise and it was the most gorgeous bird i mean they're so beautiful seeing them up close and all of the detail and their their spotted feathers and then it was you know i had had a little squirrel but this was food this was like a meal and i was so grateful and it was so beautiful and to me what was so big about that was that i felt like in that moment the land had deemed me worthy I had gone from no food for weeks, but still so grateful to be there and still giving my prayers to the land every day and singing the sun up and singing the sun down. And I felt like the land was testing me. I had had nothing to eat from the land, but I was still so happy to be there and so connected and so in gratitude in every moment. And that was when the land was like, okay, you've earned it. And then I got two things in one hour after nothing for weeks. It was huge and that changed everything for me. So birds and bird language were a huge part of my story all along, but that bird changed my life forever. You know, that, that moment was so huge. And you know, from then on, I was certain that I was gonna be eating grouse regularly. <laughs> um, that isn't, that isn't how things went. I made that grouse last. I think I ate the squirrel that day and I saved the grouse till the next day and I made that grouse last five days, which was probably foolish. You know, that's like, I mean, grouse is smaller than a chicken. That's like having a, making a chicken breast last for, okay. It's like making a game hen last for four or five days. So it wasn't as much food as I needed at all, but it was food. And when you have gone two weeks of intense activity in a very cold place without any food, the difference between food and no food is so huge and there were so so many huge lessons that i brought back from my time in the arctic one of the biggest ones was we have no idea how good we have it you know we have no idea in this country there are places in the world where people understand the value of food but this country things are so out of proportion and the biggest take-home message that I want to, well, there are so many. One of the big take-home messages is that, all right, that is my, I've yammered on for 40 minutes. I'll yammer on for another few before, uh, before opening to questions. But um, is that any day that you have food, any food, but if it's enough food, that is a good day. You have nothing to complain about <laughs> if you have enough food. That is that is the source of all life it is the most important thing and we take it for granted we use it for for entertainment 
you know we have no idea what it is to to live on the edge of survival the way that wild things do to feel viscerally what animals in the landscape feel when they're out there you know like what every every little piece of grain that you drop from your from your popcorn what that is to a wild animal that lives on the edge of survival like that it's so important for us to be more in touch with that a practice that i've had since leaving is occasionally fasting going a whole day without food just to remember that i just feel like it serves us so well to really know hunger and really know want because we so rarely do in our culture and you know thinking about how this stuff relates to birds also you know birds are are at the very edge of survival in a way that not all wild creatures are because flight is a really intense physiological feature right and so birds have they can't carry extra they can't put on extra weight in the way that other animals can because they have to fly with it so it's a you know it's a null equation if you put on a lot of extra weight as a bird then it's just harder to fly so they are living in that precarious place where like the food for one day or two days makes a big difference in their life and I was starting to get a little bit in touch with that in two weeks but it took me it took me several more months out <laughs> starving in the Arctic to really really get that in a deeper way um, so so that moment was really big and I didn't get any more grouse with my boat they were actually quite rare visitors to my peninsula but you know one of the most beautiful things that helped me mark my time out there was was the bird movement through that area because again in this really extreme environment it's really big when I first got there there were waterfowl around and then within the first two weeks there started to be the migrations of swans so there were trumpeting swan flying over my peninsula all the time it was so amazing these huge beautiful kite-sized white birds that were just honking in this crazy eerie melodic you know really unusual noise all the time so the trumpeting swans definitely marked my first couple weeks out there and then the time after which they left was was a big marker and then the gray jays showing up and what companions those gray jays were and if you who you know are bird enthusiasts and know the corvid family know that they're they're really different than other birds and will spoke to this a bit they have a lot of personality and gray jays in particular they're they're birds that are mostly in northern areas and they're so inquisitive and curious and friendly and mostly they live places where there's not a lot of handouts you know they don't get that kind of jaded seagull <laughs> attitude um so so they were you know that that was really lovely to have that relationship with the gray jays and uh, there was another bird that I wasn't familiar with that started to show up about a month in, which were called red poles, and I didn't know that they were called red poles until after I came out. Um, but these beautiful little, I called them zoinkers because they would make this zoink, 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 zoink no, name. So, you know, again, not knowing, not knowing the names of things, then you name them based on their characteristics. So I called them zoinkers. And they would usually, they would be like a flock of a hundred or not at all. And they would come and they would eviscerate all of the berries on my peninsula <laughs> which I would have thought was cute <laughs> some other time but it was really frustrating because that was mostly what I had was cranberries that were already very low food value but I started finding just all of these husks of cranberries just completely eviscerated little cranberries where they would just leave the skin so it's like not not just that they ate your food but they're like ah, I ate your food you know leaving the wrappers around um, so you know birds were very very much tied into my story in all kinds of ways chickadees also were really important and um, asked Laura to do a drawing of a chickadee for me before I left because I really I really identify with chickadees they're a bit of a totem bird for me partly because they are so tough but they're so little and cute you know like they're they're these teensy little puffballs that are so unassuming but they live in some of the most extreme environments in the world and they're some of the only birds that live year-round in those environments so here we are the freaking arctic it's really extreme it is really cold it's really intense and they're just like chipper and in the branches and you know <laughs> dancing around and I, I like to think that i'm kind of cute and little and that people might think i'm not as tough as i am but i'm tough damn it and um and you know i got the like stripes of white and white and dark on my head too so chickadees are like my people and um and chickadees would come through regularly you know in in my spot i'd have little flocks of chickadees and 
so I, I said that I would circle back to what it was to be out there without without human contact, you know, and being alone and the isolation. And I was expecting some of that. I never dealt with that at all. I never need to pull out any of those tricks that my friend Twig had taught me for regulating my nervous system. I just absolutely felt like I was stepping into this greater community from the second I was on the ground. I felt that land absolutely open the arms to me and want me there. And part of that is I believe because I was so devoted, even when times were hard for me, I found something to be grateful for. You know, I, I continued that practice of singing the sun up and down. Well, I will say I started to let go of singing it up because mornings were the hardest, you know, getting out of that sleeping bag. Sometimes it was all I could do to, to get my boots on. You know, it was way below zero by the time I, I came out. Um, but singing the sun down kept being a regular practice. And I made, I made weekly routines as well. So Mondays were self-care day. I didn't ever have time to do anything special for me because I considered survival self-care. Um, <laughs> but, but I went out with the intention to just kind of hold that in mind. So I might like stop and dry my socks in the middle of the day as well as at the end of the day on a Monday. Or like take an extra 30 seconds combing my fingers through my hair that day. Just something to mark that day. And Thursdays were dance party days. <laughs> so every Thursday until the very, very end, when I didn't have it in me, which was part of how I knew it was time to go. Um, but every Thursday I would go out and I would sing a little song to myself. I couldn't sing it out loud because they couldn't use it because of copyright issues. So I would just sing in my head and I would just dance. And you know, sometimes it was like an 80s dance party. And the one time they ever showed it was I was waltzing, you know, waltzing by myself on the rocks. And once on after, um, you know, the Day of the Dead, Samhain, Halloween, um, I had an ancestor feast. And so that Thursday I danced an Irish jig for my Irish ancestors. And you know, every, every week it was something, it was something particular. And to me, it was like, if I'm not loving being out there enough to be dancing, then what am I doing? You know, I was out there and it, it's a competition, the show, it's a competition to see who can stay the longest. But that isn't how I held it. You know, I held it as I want to be out here as long as I possibly can, because this is my ideal way to live. You know, because I love this and I want to push myself and I want to see what it's really like after decades of devotion to these skills, I really want to push myself. And you know, I kept waiting for when that was going to happen and when it was going to get hard and when I was going to have to really push through that, that misery and that depredation, you know, um, deprivation, that's the word, not depredation. I didn't get predated upon, thank goodness. Um, but it, it never happened. I was loving it until the very end and I did, I, I said I, I came to regret not having snare wire so I didn't get any more critters with my bow but I did um, on day 21 start trapping and again I had never done any trapping but I believed that that land wanted me there. I really felt that. Another thing I didn't say in terms of my gratitude practices was making an ancestor plate. Every time I had food, I made a little plate and I offered it to the ancestors. And that was really important. And week three, I decided I need another weekly routine and that's gonna be food Friday. Every Friday, I'm gonna do something different about getting food. I mean, every day was food day, but Fridays I would do something different and innovative. And so the first, the first time I did that was day 21 and I saw some fresh rabbit poop and I set a snare, just kind of making it up as I went along, um, making a, you know, I've studied a lot of this stuff, but I hadn't actually done it. It's not illegal to do any of the places that I've lived. So I used my fishing line to make a noose and I used a springy sapling um, and did an elaborate system to, to hold that down with the noose, not believing that it was gonna work because I didn't know what I was doing. And I woke up the next morning and I went to check it and I caught a rabbit, the first snare I have ever set up in my entire life. Snaring was my life from that time on. And I didn't have snare wire. I had fishing line, which is very chewable and rabbits can eat their way out of very easily. And fox can chew through and steal your rabbits very easily. So, you know, I, I lasted for 73 days. I was, it was, it was, it got as cold as minus 25 by the time it came out. I lost 50 pounds. Oh my God. And I was loving it. I was having the time of my life every single day. And they would come out, they got to, they do medical checks on you. Once it gets to a certain point, they do medical checks on you because they can't have you die out there. And at first they were kind of concerned about me and like, uh, you know, 
how does it feel to be this skinny? And I'd be like, I don't know. I'm not even sure what you're talking about. Like, I'm doing great. I feel so strong. I felt so strong. I felt so strong until the very end. And I, and I continued trapping and I had long periods of not being successful with trapping and then periods with stuff just barely trickling in. I never had enough to eat. Not a single day out there did I take in as many calories as I was burning. I, I trapped a total of 10 rabbits and about 13 squirrel and that grouse. And that's what I had to eat for 73 days. So it's kind of remarkable that I only lost up 50 pounds. Um, and it was towards the very, very end that I started to really know, like come to understand what was happening in my body. Cause it was so cold. I mean, it was so cold. I had, you know, all of my layers on all the time. They're like, how does it feel to be this skinny? And I was like, I don't look at my body. Are you kidding me? It's minus 20 degrees. I don't, you know, just check out how skinny I am. So I didn't really know, but I could tell with how concerned they were that it was getting to be an issue. And that very last week I started to get to where I could feel it in my body. And it wasn't that I wasn't capable of doing things. It was that it was harder to motivate to do those things. I could do them, but I had to push myself. I had to get past this inertia that just wanted to sit, you know? Um, and that last Thursday, I didn't dance. You know, and it started to get to where it felt like a chore to go out to the water and sing the sundown. And I said to myself, you know what, this isn't how I wanted it to be. I said that I wasn't going to be here if I couldn't be here in the spirit with which I came. You know, if I'm not excited to dance and if I'm not in full gratitude, that's something to look at. And then I started to really feel my body. And I had said for the longest time, I was like, well, you know, once it gets really bad, I've still got another couple weeks because I got this booty, you know, I got <laughs> boobs, I got belly, I can live in, you know, I'm a rounder person. And I was like, no problem. And then I started to actually feel my body and realize that those were already gone, long gone, you know, like I could feel my jutting hip bones. I could feel my ribs when they came and did medical checks, my skin, I looked like I was 80 years old. You know, my skin was so wrinkly from losing so much weight so quickly. And I started to really get the state of my body, but I hadn't felt it because I felt so connected to that landscape. I felt so buoyed up by that place. I felt so wanted and so much a part of it. And wrapping it all back, like to me, those are the most important survival skills. You know, the physical skills, those matter, but feeling like a part of the landscape, you know, feeling connected, feeling feeling what it is to be wild and knowing how to appreciate every little gift you get, appreciating that half hour of sun because you haven't seen the sun for four days, you know, being able to really sink into that, that is the biggest survival skill there is. And if more of us understood that in a, in a visceral way, this world would look so different, you know? Like if we could come to appreciate what one calorie means rather than filling every spare moment with something to, to entertain us or distract us or, you know, make us feel good about ourselves because our culture tries to make us feel like crap, so we'll buy more stuff to feel better. You know, these are not just survival skills for the wilderness. These are survival skills for being being alive today. And if people could, could find that and feel more whole, then they wouldn't need to be extracting from the world in the ways that are causing the demise of everything that we know and care about and depend upon. So to my mind, Arctic survival and birds and bird language and the survival of the planet, those are all the same thing. And my, my business is Buckskin Revolution because I believe that these skills are revolutionary and that returning to those skills that we evolved to do changes something inside us, changes our culture, changes our world. And that's, that's the work that I do now. So I have a YouTube channel and I'm trying to put out more videos about this stuff. Um, I, I have a couple books that I'm working on. Um, I, have a, I have a website you can check out, buckskinrevolution.com. I have a mailing list over there. Um, check out my videos and subscribe to my YouTube. But I'm, I'm trying to start a revolution. <laughs> That's why I did the show. That's why I named my, my book and my business what it is, because I feel like these skills are super vital and that you don't have to rely on them. You don't have to go and live two and a half months in the Arctic to feel what it is. But just, you know, like, to harvest something wild that you ingest once a week. You know, any little way that you can incorporate this stuff into your life, it's gonna make a difference. And, and that's what I'm trying to put out in the world. And I know I've probably spoken too long because I tend to do that, but thank you all. Oh, it's exactly 5.30. That's when I was supposed to stop.
Um, so we can hang out a little bit if folks want to ask questions. Yes. Hi. I have two questions. First one's really simple. What is pemmican? <laughs> so pemmican is a mixture of dried meat okay. and fat and dried okay. berries. Okay. So it's this really rich protein and vitamin and calorie source. And then the second, I was just wondering, you talked about like the, the, the weeks and the date numbers and your rituals. How did you keep track of time for that long? Great question. So I had a hearthstone okay. and I would write the day of the week and the date on it and how many days out. And I did that religiously for a okay. while and then I was like, or I could just look at that little number on my camera. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> and so eventually I started doing that because yeah, okay. the camera said the time and the date Got on it. it. <laughs> yes. So you talked a little bit about how the birds kind of make you feel less alone out there. Maybe I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about like what the birds and observing the birds helped you. How how that how that helped. Absolutely. You yeah. You know I. I I had all these ideas for this talk and one of the things I wanted to say is like, you know, I think that people think about how, how bird language relates to survival and that like you're out there and then you hear an alarm and you turn around and there's the cougar about to pounce on you. And I didn't have any moments like that. But I did have one profound like real bird language moment, which was being in my shelter or, you know, working around my shelter and hearing a bunch of bird alarms, like hearing a very different kind of bird language than I was used to hearing and I knew that they were alarms and I went out to this clearing near my shelter and there was like classic bird language a parabola which is one of the shapes which is a bunch of birds alarming and pointing out uh, an avian predator so I got to see and uh, it was this huge occipiter which I believe was a northern goshawk right because they're the biggest the yeah. biz biggest exhibitor was huge and all of these birds alarming and pointing to it and I got to watch it for a while and I got it on film but they didn't show it they show like point zero one percent of our footage right because I had thousands of hours of footage and they showed me for like 50 minutes total um, but you know also I think the thing for me with bird language and I think Will was speaking it, uh, to it a bit in the sit spot is just feeling like a part of things so to me like I never felt alone not because I knew what the birds were saying in that moment but because I have a practice of sitting regularly and and dropping in and feeling like a part of the landscape and so that was with me the whole time i mean certainly you know there there were bird language things like that event but nothing directly related to survival except that that sense of curiosity and and aliveness and like feeling engaged with the world i think those were huge i think those were key to my survival and the feeling of companionship that i had from those gray jays and those chickadees like knowing a chickadee and knowing like you're my guy like you're my totem person and having them show up regularly i mean that felt like being directly spoken to you know yeah. so yeah it was huge yes um slight change of subject how do you get back into eating again after there's like the first few days after which you have to gradually start eating yes there's a whole process because you can kill yourself starting to eat again after that level of starvation i actually have a youtube video about it um which i would recommend you to number three of my body on alone talks about my recovery process but it was a slow process of easing back into food and being skinny for a while and then putting on way too much weight too fast and having some like some compulsive eating stuff because that's gonna happen when you starve for a long time and then gradually coming back to my normal body i would say i still carry a, like a little bit more weight than i did before i went because my body needs that to feel safe you know which i think is great it makes perfect sense um i understand that now as a survival thing in a different way than i would have previously did you notice that any food you ate you went back to eating you notice it made you feel a certain way uh i was really sensitive to sugar for a while mm -hmm. yeah i would really feel zingy and weird and off in my body after having refined sugars um i had them anyway <laughs> I, was all about them for a while. I got back just before christmas so i was like all about christmas cookies <laughs> my housemate and i you know I, I no longer live with the same person but we still laugh about that just like it was there was a lot of baking going on in December. <laughs> um, but yeah it was profound it's still profound it's still different my relationship with food will never be the same did you have your hand up I guess I'm just curious, you know, such a profound, life-changing thing. What, what would you say, just off the top of your head, is the biggest difference in your outlook, as yeah. opposed to before, as now, after? Yeah, what, what's question. the biggest change you've noticed? Uh, my self-confidence is definitely different. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like I can do freaking anything. You know? <laughs> uh, I know that I can't necessarily, but like I didn't know that I was capable of that. So, so I felt like I just proved myself in a huge way. And I also feel, I feel, I guess, more confident in what I have to share with the world. I, I have the same message. I'm, I'm sharing similarly, but I, I believe in it. I believe in the potency of it so much more having really, really lived into it in such a really deep, profound way. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of other things certainly, but like in terms of the biggest thing, that's, that's one of the big ones I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like loved your premise that if we could be more connected to the place around us, we could behave in a way that's better for the, the planet. I was hoping you give us a couple more ideas of how we could like do that regularly, daily, or, or weekly. Little bit of ideas. Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, I definitely, you know, some of the things we've been talking about here, I really feel like sit spots and bird language are huge. Um, I really, you know, I think that one of the things that we're really missing in our culture is just slow time. I think that, you know, we can like, we can take in and take in and take in and think that it's enriching our lives through learning about this or that, but, but when we never take the time to integrate, you know, we never just have an hour unplanned, completely unplanned, where we just do whatever we feel like doing, that's when we actually start to process all of the things we're taking in and integrate. I think that, you know, my, my personal mission is having people have more things in their life that come from the land around them. For me, that's wearing buckskin clothes regularly. It's eating wild food. I mean, I'm a huge advocate of finding something wild to eat as often as you can, you know? to develop a relationship with the wild things right around you. You could live in, you know, in a townhouse in San Francisco and have zero access to anything but concrete, but there's pigeons in the city, you know, and there are like, like seeds and pollen in the air and spiders flying through on, on webs, you know, like connecting with something in the wild, you know, developing curiosity and like, like not just knowing what the bird is, but noticing that, oh my God, scrub jays have this little patch of white above their eye. I've never seen that before. You know, like really cultivating that kind of relationship where you actually feel connected and that, that starts to change you on a deep physical level as well as emotional. And encouraging that in your friends, you know, like asking your friends, what amazing wild thing did you see today? And starting a culture of that, you know, just like little ripples in a pond and each one spreads out and becomes a little bit bigger. And before long, we've created this culture where that's recognized as a thing to talk about. And then the fact that we talk about that make people more likely to engage in that. And yeah, things like that. <laughs> Lara, and then this one, and then I bet we should be wrapping up and I'll try to keep my answers briefer. <laughs> I really talk a lot. We have um, a choice between two. One is remember pretty much like this day last year you were out mm. there. Anything to say about that? Or, or like how did you get out of bed on the hardest morning? Like what, what was that? that yeah, one of those two. What? Okay, so October 26th would have been right before Samhain and I was saving up food so that I could have an ancestor feast. I was crossing my fingers yeah. that I would actually have food. I think I had a day that I had two rabbits pretty close to one another and I saved the back straps and the organs from one to have as my ancestor feast. Um, so that's one of the things I was doing is anticipating that. And then very slowly, I had a process. It took me like an hour to get out of bed. First I would like find my socks and put them on. Well, first I would pitch my, my snuggle rocks out of the sleeping bag because I would heat rocks and put them in with me. And uh, so I would pitch those and then I would like find my bra and wiggle into that. And then I would find all the different things and wiggle into those and, and then like work my feet out of the bottom of my sleeping bag to get them into my felt liners and just like bit by bit putting on my armor. And, and yeah, just, it was, it was work. That was the hardest thing. Absolutely. The morning was the hardest part of every day. 